Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jason Avant, and I'm here with my good friend and teammate, Quentin Michael. This is the Q&A podcast. We are always coming to you on the Inside the Birds platform, YouTube channel, also Amazon Music, Facebook, Instagram, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, continue to submit your questions to inside the birds at gmail.com. We like to say thank you to all the fans for your feedback. We're going to continue to answer those questions throughout training camp. Um, we're excited about the things that has transpired over the last couple of weeks. We don't know if we are just um, optimistic because of training camp and we have football in the air and it's near, but we're starting to feel that bug, that Eagles fever that's going around. So Q, say what's up to the people and let's get this show on the road. Yeah, let's get it, man. Exciting time of the year. You know, I always love the time of year, man. Excited. So, you know, without further ado, let's let's get the rocket, man. Let's get All it. right. Without further ado, um, we want to shout out to our man, um, Jeff Mosher. Happy birthday to him. Um, yeah, Adam happy and everyone that's responsible for Inside the Birds, uh, Hunter. But again, happy birthday, Jeff. Woo! <laughs> I know yes, you're sir. about 59 today. We're not going to say, you know, about 59, smooth. <laughs> All yep. right. Uh, I'm not going to beat you up too bad. I know you went to Penn State. That's bad enough by itself. I, can't, I still can't <laughs> believe it. Like, he actually goes around and admitting that he went to Penn State. Man, uh, come on. <laughs> we are in last place all the time. All right. So, he, <laughs> first topic. Oh, okay. First topic today, man, can't get right. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> My goodness, the man leaves this city and hopes for a better future, reacquainted with Frank Wright, familiar offense. They want him there. We've heard about it all offseason. Carson Wentz gets injured. Mm. What do you think about this and how – devastating you think it is for him how what does this mean for his future what does this means for the Colts so many different things on my mind about this what do you think buddy yeah man it's you know first of all you know my heart goes out to him um you know he's certainly a guy that that wants to com compete and wants to go out there and get better and, and it's just it's just weird because some people just kind of have that that I don't want to say it's a black cloud but they just have that injury bug and it, and it takes a mm -hmm. it takes um, it takes a well. I'll put it this way: it takes a lot of luck to make it through an entire season unscathed. But to to you know every single year, each each and every year to have to deal with it, um, you know possible season-ending injuries. It's it's tough, man. And and you know it's it's a rough situation for him. I know you know he's going through it right now. Um, you know I know the Colts are you know they're most likely really frustrated because, you know, they're kind of back to square one. You know, they thought they had the answer at the quarterback position and, you know, and I'm sure the teammates. And so it's just tough because you kind of feel like, you know, where do we go from here? You know, but the one and, and the one thing I would say about this is it reminds me of a guy um, and a guy that had uh, quite a few devastating injuries, um, you know, multiple years. And he's a man of strong faith, as you know, um, one of our old teammates and, and, if, if there's anyone, if I was Carson, that I would try to to try to emulate or try to talk to or even, you know, maybe have him reach out, it would be Thomas Davis. Um, Thomas mm -hmm. Davis has, has dealt with, um, I think it was three ACL tears. It was like right back to back to back to back. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, a guy, he never, never lost his faith and just kept working and coming back and, you know, had a long, long career. So, you know, it kind of reminds me of that situation where you just got a guy that's just a good guy. Um, you know, he's had a, t a couple of rough years here, and you just kind of hope that he can bounce back after this. Yeah, so um, this will be four out of his six seasons where he has dealt with injury yeah. and or his his season has been affected by injury. One of those were, you know, affected by, you know, um, you know, play. And, but it's it's a it's a shame and you want him to do well because he's a great person. Um, and I think the Thomas Davis analogy is like the best is the best analogy. Um, and I think Carson has played way more than Car than, than Thomas Davis did. 
um, his first four years of, of, of playing the National Football League yeah. was on injured reserve. And, um, and it took him a lot to overcome and turned out to be a fantastic player, still explosive, still hungry, still love the game. Hopefully Carson has that type of fight. It takes a different type of mentality. We've known him to be a little bit fragile in the past. So these injuries, when you couple, you know, when you couple these injuries and start putting together and you start to get a label of being injury prone or not being reliable, it's going to take another level of, of, of mental toughness to overcome this. So hopefully he can dig down deep and get to that place and want to become the player that he has the potential to become. Um, you know, so it's it's tough. But now I want to talk about personal experience. I think everyone in the National Football League gets injured at some point. I think it's all about when you get injured. And um, I was fortunate enough to have most of my injuries in the off season where, you know, it didn't matter or I had time to come back. Um, people may not even known that I was hurt or had a surgery in the off season, that type of thing. Um, so that's the most, um, you know, that's like the best case scenario, but it's still grueling. It takes a bunch because it's, it's, you know what weighs you down about an injury cue is that one day you're just walking or you're running a route and you're fine, and the next day you're in a training room. And you're like, dude, how did one day this occur? And you're just thinking about it like, dude, this is just bananas. This is bizarre. Yeah. And that's what I love about the game of football because the game of football won't allow you to stay on top forever. Mm -hmm. And in those bottom times, in those times where you're down and you can't do anything about it, that's where people start to look toward faith. They start to be introspective. They begin to work on their character. They begin to become a better person. And that's the thing that I love about the game of football. Basketball is always the same conditions over and over again, you know. You know, football, there's um, a life aspect to the game where it's going to be hot one day, it's going to be cold another day, windy the next day. Like, there's always things that make you look up and make you look outside yourself. And I think these injuries kind of develop the character. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, talk about – so, you know, I've only had really two major injuries. Um, my – my last major injury actually put me in the retirement, made me decide I, I didn't want to come back. But I had a Liz, Liz Frank fracture and Dr. Anderson, who actually saw Carson, um, did my surgery. And, um, and you know, by that point, I kind of knew what I, I was ready to be done. But my, my yeah. first major injury happened um, the year of the Super Bowl. I actually got hurt in the Super Bowl. Because um, mm -hmm. actually, I got I hurt it originally two, two weeks before, um, two or three weeks before the Super Bowl, the game against Dallas, I dislocated my shoulder. Um, I tried to do the rehab, um, went through rehab two weeks and getting into the um, off season. <clears throat> Last, the playoff games, I wore a harness on my shoulder. And, um, you know, in the Super Bowl, second half, uh, first kickoff of the second half, it popped out again. And mm -hmm. I just knew, you know, I was going to need surgery. And um, I remember the next, <laughs> we got back after losing that game to, to New England. And, uh, you know, I was having surgery the next day or the day after, I, I can't remember. And the thing I remember the most about that entire time was like shoulders are naturally a longer rehab, but it's, mm -hmm. it, it was like, it was grueling. I mean, it was, it was long. I mean, I'll never forget the first day after surgery. And the first thing they want you to do is get your shoulder. Mm -hmm. oh. And I've never felt that the two worst pains I've ever felt in my life was the, the night of the surgery when my nerve block ran out and I had to, and I didn't take my medication in time. And then the first day when I had to start m rotating that shoulder and getting movement and blood back in there. And that right there was the first injury and the first time where I was like, man, <laughs> I don't know if I have it in me. And, you know, but but that's the time where you just kind of, you take you take a step back and you focus on what you want. And, you know, I the, the training staff was amazing. They kept, they kept you focused and they kept you, you know, hitting these milestones and working and working and working. And, you know, it was a long, grueling process to get back to to getting ready for a training camp. But, you know, there were some low times. And there were times yeah. where you, you just feel like, man, I don't want to go to rehab today. It's like, yeah, 
everybody's going on vacation. They, 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 you know, you're, you're there by yourself. Family, you're there doing, doing rehab by yourself. And so it's really hard. And you can see a lot of people don't know. Um, and this is the last point I'll make. A lot of people don't know, like when a guy, especially a young guy, when he goes on IR, it's a very, very dangerous time for that player. So, um, meaning you start to feel like you're not a part of anything. And so what, what I think was really good was, you know, under the, the Reed, Coach Reed's um, staff is even though a, pl a player was on IR and wasn't going to play that year, they still came to meetings. They still hung around the players. So they would do their rehab and they were still in the building. Some teams, they don't, once you're on IR, they don't want, they don't want you around. around. Yeah. So a lot of guys struggle with that because then you don't feel like you're part of the team. But, you know, that's one of the good things that I think that Andy, Andy did that, you know, kept guys in the fold and kept guys around. Well, hopefully Carson like um, can can overcome five to twelve weeks. Usually, when they give that type of um, discrepancy, that type of you know length, it's usually more toward the twelve, and it's yeah. kind of speaking toward that Liz Frank as we talked about earlier. We don't know why they want to they don't come out and say that, but five to twelve, five if everything is perfect, which I've never seen an injury like that be perfect. So. It's going to be more toward that 12 range. So you can uh, you can expect at some point um, if their second round pick, um, fourth round pick doesn't, um, you know, pan out, uh, they're going to be looking for a quarterback. And you may see a guy named Nick Foles back in, uh, backing up Carson again. And that would be so. another story. <laughs> In and of itself, right? So let's 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 keep it moving, though. Let's let's talk about the first padded practice. The Eagles had their first padded practice today, um, and there's always this anticipation with the pads. Always an anticipation when you have your first padded practice because um, there's this term that we always use that everybody looks good in shorts, and it's true because people know that they're not going to get hit, so they're a little less <laughs> likely to. I mean, they're a little more likely to 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 be more confident, to run through a pass, run through the whole hard, those types of things. When you get pads on and now you come down to earth a bit, knowing that now there's repercussions for my actions. I can't just run across your middle, middle of your field without paying a tax. And a tax is usually getting hit, right? <laughs> so then yeah. the mindset of the player changes. And that first day in pads, I've, the defense is always more hyped about the first day of pass than the offense. The offense is like, oh, it's the first day of pass. The defense is like, it's the first day of pass. Y'all been catching all these touchdowns on 7 on 7, all this clapping, yelling up and down, and all that stuff. Let's see if you can do it now. Right? So defense is hyped about it because they're ready to lay it into you and let you know that y'all really hadn't been winning, you know, this whole time. So uh, oh, yeah. talk about that first day of pass from a defensive perspective. Man, I love the first day of pass because everything you say is 100%, right? Like, listen, now we've been going. Now it's not just – it, it's not just the first couple of days of training camp. We talk about OTAs. Yeah, we kicking your butt rookie, this whole time. Kicking our butts, right? Y'all y'all running running post routes right through the middle like a safety ain't right there. You catch the ball, you get up. Yeah. Push down. <laughs> you know how y'all do you know, so it's our first chance to get a little get back, man. So, you know, it, it's exciting time and, and it's a lot of fun because, you know, not necessarily you want to punish guys, but it's also just that's when it starts to feel like real football. You know, when you yeah. put the pads on, that's when it, you start to think about back in the day when you were a little man, you got your cleats on, my piece ready. So it just brings back all the nostalgia and, and that exciting times of, you know, like, let, let's let's get back to playing real football. So. What about you, man? I know, I know you guys. I know you guys. I, I actually loved it. There's okay. a like I was just from from a different time where we had, you know, I went to Michigan where we had the Michigan drill where you had pads on, and it was a competition between the the receivers and the DBs with cock knockdowns and knocking people over and pancaking them, and you know, it was like this thing that was football. And so I love the pads because I knew that cream rise to the top when it came yeah. to pads. I knew that all of these dudes that were here to take my spot, when it was time to put those pads on and it's time to go dig out the safety, I'm going to do it willingly, freely, happy, with a smile on my face, running there full speed, Brian Dawkins, you, don't matter. <laughs> I don't care. I like contact, right? So I'm not afraid. 
So I knew I would shine and pass. And I like I like a person being near me, close to me. And that's what you learn. When you put on pads, you begin to learn that there's a lot of guys that don't like people close to them. You know, <laughs> they don't like people in their space. They don't like people touching them. Yeah. They don't like that hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's what that's the difference. The difference is that the level of competitiveness changes. Yeah. Now you have to, instead of just running your route and smacking somebody's hands, you literally have to turn into a pit bull. Like, no, get your hands off. Don't touch me. Like, you know what I mean? And, and, you, and, and mean it. Yeah. And if, if you don't mean it, they're going to keep punking you the whole time. You got to be willing to get into a fight every single play. And mm -hmm. that mentality that football mindset of get off me, aggressive, like confrontational type of, type of player has to come out of you in that moment. If yeah. it doesn't come out of you, then football may not be for you. And <laughs> exactly. that's the that's the part about pads be, that 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 you love. Um, and and guys with a lot of talent are. Are, are are extremely talented until they put pads on. Yeah. Because they yeah. can't deal with that level of 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 intensity and competitiveness that elevates you when you put on the pads. You know, so um that that's that's football. Pad, putting on pads is is football. It's time to get hit, it's time to lay some hits. It gets you used to contact. It gets you used to um actually going over the middle and actually taking a shot because you still can take shots with pads because they can thud you because you're in the air sometimes, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So uh -huh. you get used to that. And that's 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 fun, man. That's fun. Man. Yeah. And for the people that, that may not may or may not know, there's different levels of contact, right? So you have full go, which is full tackle to the ground, tackle which ground. you rarely do a whole lot of. And then there's thud, which is, you know, um, let's say running back gets the ball in the handoff and he's running full speed. It's not a full tackle, but you give him a little little shoulder as a defender. Stop, stop his momentum, and then you let him run. So that's the and then obviously you know when you're just in helmets and and all that, there's just no contact at all. But no um, just so everyone knows that. Yeah, that is. usually when usually when you have your first day of pads, now you can have a real one on one with the O line and D line. That's like yeah. that's right there because now you get the left tackle. Defensive end matchup one on one, you know, you start to get the safeties and tight ends, you know, getting in people's face, you know. Yep. So it, it it just means a bunch. I'm getting excited just talking about <laughs> it, right? So um, there's a few things that happened this week, Q, in practice, right? So on um, a practice this week, Nick Sirianni in the middle of practice um, wasn't liking the way that practice was going now he's an offensive coach q q he didn't <laughs> like the way the practice was going he stops the practice he has some word this is something that rarely ever happens in the national football league not in the middle of practice mm -hmm. um has some words sends it out there to practice now he's a hands-on coach do you think this is just him trying to be hands-on and fire him up or do you think this is like the defense was dominating so let's give everybody a talk since offense isn't, isn't playing well see now this is and as soon as i heard that i'm like here we go now this is what happened when you get an offensive head coach all right you can't you can't be happy that the defense is having a good day and dominating the offense like i know you're an offensive coach but you're gonna need defense at some point right why we get our defense players got to get scolded. And if you want to scold somebody, pull the offense to the side. You go off on them because they're getting a bus book. But no, no, um, in, in all seriousness, um, I sometimes sometimes things like this is kind of needed. And um, I'm okay with it in the sense that, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a rookie head coach. He didn't like the way things were going. He tried to put it into it right then and there. And so – that right there is, is, in my opinion, setting the tone of what's to be expected. Because like you said, it rarely happens in the national football. I don't think I've ever had one practice where Andy started, stopped the entire practice and went off on us. So um, I think that it's very it's unorthodox, but I actually like it. I think it's something that, you know, maybe um, probably needed to be happening at that at that point. It's a little unusual, but, you know, I'm, I'm OK with it. What about you? 
Well, so let me let me discuss this 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 myth that <laughs> offensive coaches only say that only you know <laughs> have something to say about practice when offense isn't doing good. It's a myth. <laughs> I've had mostly offensive coaches, but it's not a myth. It's true. Most of, so, so, so I I can't even I can't even lie with a straight for a straight face there. So it's truth when you're an offensive coach. The offense is doing terrible. The defense is balling. You like this practice is terrible. <laughs> you hear about it the entire time. You you know the defense is like, man, come on, we we get, never get no love, never get no credit. No, because y'all don't supposed to win. The rules are set up for us to win. No man. one came to see you, Otis. <laughs> they came to see David Ruffin, and that's offense. <laughs> that's us. That's touchdowns. Nobody cares about the defense. Oh man. That's so tough. <laughs> I don't know if we said it on the show, but we talked about it. I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but that that reminds me of in training camp when we had one on ones, man. Nobody ever cheered for the defense. Like no. Y'all score bomb after bomb on us. All you hear is ah! defensive not decent player not defensive player knocks the ball down and gets a pick and it's like crickets out there, man. Come on. Yeah. That's the, you know, because they came to see us. We the show, baby. <laughs> we pretty. We came out there, they come to see us. <laughs> oh, man, y'all crazy. I know. Now, so but. to get back to get back to that, um, I thought it was. I, I think if you if you have a standard and you're trying to create culture, you may need to do those types of things, especially starting out, because these guys don't know what to expect from you, and maybe they don't understand your standard where you're trying to take them. So if you have to interject yourself more and more early so they can understand what the expectation is so they can never say, hey, coach was okay with that, that mediocre practice, that mediocre effort, whatever it may be. So he he put himself in a way and he said, hey, this is unacceptable and this won't happen again. This is not what we are. This is not who we are. And this, this is, we won't practice like this. So I like that because you, you're establishing your culture. So um, step up and, and, and do what you have to do as a coach. I like the fact that he's so hands-on. Yeah. Every time I see a video, every time I see an article, that's the one thing that you can, you can count on the article talking about is how Nick Sirianni is so hands-on. He's always coaching the receivers. I don't even necessarily know what they need the receiver coach for. Every time <laughs> I see him, he's coaching the receivers about everything. And um, so um, I know that he has the background in receivers, so I'm looking forward to see the receiver position step up and play really well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, you're 100% to it. And I would say, too, with the, with the entire coaching staff is, is very hands-on. I've, I've um, you know, been watching some of the videos and clips coming out of there, and, you know, I'm seeing a lot of cool, different, you know, um, progressive type coaching and mm -hmm. you know i'm liking what i'm seeing so far you yeah. know and and um i like the energy so you know i know it's a young coaching staff but so far i'm, I'm excited with what i'm seeing all right q What's up? all right so here's something that the fans um just football people football minds would like to know about especially in the national football league now, this is training camp. Mm -hmm. Training camp is a job interview. It's a high-intensity job interview, high, high, high stakes. How does the evaluation process happen? Now, I was a coach last year for the Eagles, and I also remember the evaluation pro um, you know, process as a player because I used to always sneak into those meetings to hear a couple of things, like because they would have them at, you know, I was always the one of the last people out of, you know, the training camp halls and, I, and the coaches used to have to stay behind. So I remember hearing a few words in those meetings. <laughs> you see eavesdropping. Um, yeah, eavesdropping 100%. <laughs> and um, so I know how that process worked. You want to talk about that a little bit? The process of? <clears throat> of evaluating. Like evaluate. So, mm-hmm. For me, so I don't, I don't have as, as much extensive um, knowledge of, of what they go do behind the scenes. I did, um, I was able to be, um, you know, 
when Chip Kelly was here, I was I was uh, in the coach in the coach. No, I wouldn't say the coaches' meetings, but it was more in the um, beginning of the training camp when I was when mm-hmm. I was doing that. So, anyway, long story short, um, to me, the way I looked at it and the way I always saw it and the way that I envisioned it as a player was it's a it's a day by day process. Um, mm-hmm. You're going to have some good days. You're going to have some bad days. The, the worst thing, though, that you can do and the thing that the coaches always look for is whether or not you're repeating the same mistakes. Yeah. If you make a mistake and they coach you up on it and you make the same mistake again, then that that becomes an issue where they're going to start looking at you like, hey, I don't know if we can have this guy here. And to me, I think the evaluation that's in my opinion, that shows that the evaluation is just as much mental as it is physical. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone at this level is the, the, the differences. I mean, you're talking about guys like Tyreek Hill with tremendous speed, but for the most part, everyone's like very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And the difference comes in with how well you can retain, how well you can make adjustments and how work, how well can you, you know, obviously execute the game plan and what you're supposed to do. So to me, I think if you do those three things well and the numbers, um, the numbers in are in the right place for you, you'll be able to make a team. Yeah. So so the evaluation process will go like this from the coaching perspective. Right. So there is multiple times that you get a chance to watch the film and can in camp is extremely hard. So as an offensive staff, the first time when, when practice is over, they can turn a film around in probably less than 30 minutes or so. So the guys outside that are tape and practice, they have so many angles. They have the end zone copy. They have the sideline copy. They may have a tight copy of one-on-ones. And they have a bunch of video guys that are producing this film. And they're so quick now that, I've seen the film up in 15, 20 minutes, but they can get it usually yeah. turning around after practice 30, 45 minutes at tops, right? Mm-hmm. So by that time you get out of the shower, you got, you grab something to eat, you head over to your office, this, the film is ready. So you have an offensive staff meeting or defensive staff meeting not too long after that, right? So your offensive staff meeting is probably going to be maybe – um, an hour after practice ends. So that's really about 30 minutes after, by the time you leave the field because guys are working um, after practice with guys and 30 minutes. So after the jug machines, after you coaching up a guy. So about 30 minutes after that point, you after you leave that field um, mm-hmm. or, or an hour after practice ends, there's probably going to be like an offensive staff meeting. Yeah. It's good for you to go and get a, a, um, a peek of the film for your guys before that meeting so you can have an idea because your offensive coordinator you have to give an account for the player uh, uh, on the field for your position group during that time so the offensive coordinator is going over the film and you guys are watching all together offensive line running backs quarterbacks receivers everyone there quality control everybody's in your meeting and they're watching they're like, hey, Coach Jay, what is the receiver doing on this? And the last thing you want to do is say, you know, I don't know, or, you know, this or that. You want guys that when the tape turns on and they're asking you questions, they know the answers because the guys that you have are reliable. If they have to constantly say, hey, that's an ME on Marcus, there's an ME on Rager. That's a mental error. That's what ME means. Or that's a drop pass. That's a negative play. You get graded as a player from the coaches on every single play. Did he execute his assignment? Yes or no. Did he do it at a high level? Yes or no. Did he make a critical mistake? Mental error. Did he make his block? Did he catch the football? Could he score a touchdown? All of these things are being evaluated each and every day. So at the end of each night, you know what every player in your position group 
has done. And you know what everybody in your on the offensive side of the ball has done because you guys are talking about that and everybody can see the film. And you have to rate your guys each and every day. And one time a week, you have to give a ranking top to bottom of where you see your position group or where you, where you see the linebackers or where you see the receivers. And you rate them from 1 to 11 that's at training camp. This is why this is guy's number one. This is why this guy number two. This is why this is three. This is why it's four. This guy is right on that line. I like him a bunch. I want to see more of him, see if he can move up into my top three, but he definitely has the potential. This guy has the potential, but his mindset sucks, and he's not coming to meetings on time. He's not um, yeah. in the training room. They're giving a whole synopsis of this. Not only is the are the players doing this, the weight room staff has something to say about it. The special team coach has something to say about it. The training room has something to say about it. And if you get a bunch of opinions that are positive for a guy and this guy is like four or five on your list, he's like at that, you know, five or six on your list. But the special team coach love him. The, 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 um, the weight room coach loves him. The training staff loves him. And then you have a guy that – you really love, but none of these other coaches, it's going to be hard for you to win over the coaching staff for them. And that's what you see happening. You see this, 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 this positioning by the coaches for the guys that they like and what, who they, who they dislike and guys that are on the border. So this is a lot of information I'm giving you guys, but there are so many decisions that has to be made. And, and each and every week you have to rank those guys and check this out. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the head coach. So because the head coach has his rankings too. Yep. And 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 if you know players, you the, the, the best evaluators that I've seen, they don't care about the head coach, they don't care about the GM, they don't care about that. They they'll say, This is my guys, and I stand on these guys. You like number five, but number five never knows his assignment. He was he was he was picked higher. He was drafted in the second round, but he can't play better than the guy that was undrafted. I love evaluators like that. It's only a few of them that I've met, but there are some dudes that are just like that. And usually those dudes are right. And 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 they create a lot of turmoil because they they would they make the GM look bad, they may like make the head coach look bad, but they're true to who they are, and I love guys like that. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because because I mean ultimately it's it's their behinds on the line. I mean, when you think about it, if 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 I'm if I'm an evaluator, you've got to be you've got to be like that. I mean Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, if, if you're making your decisions based on what you think a coach is feeling or what you think a GM's feeling, are you really are you really doing your job? Right? Yeah. You're not doing your job. And so if you're going to be honest with yourself, you're going to be honest with your players. You owe it to your players. You owe it to your coach. You owe it to, to everyone in the, in the organization, to be honest with you. So I'm with you 100% on that. Yeah. So you That's may be a coach, and you may have your, your six or seven, eight guys your position that you want. And where a guy was drafted, how much he's getting paid. That's really outside of what you do as a coach. Mm -hmm. And you can't control the guys that are on your team the entire time. You just evaluate and say, these are the guys that I like. And then the GM, the head coach, the the the, the upper football management usually makes the final, dis final decision. And that's where trust and that's where um we've had struggles with in the past because there's a lot of guys that feel like their football knowledge is better than the people that are making those final decisions mm -hmm. wow yeah <laughs> it's crazy man it's a lot so so coach so so ultimately coaches i've seen it where coach reed and coach reed used to do an evaluation every day in training camp and I used to sneak in those meetings, the, the um, sneak in, you know, crack the door a little bit here, see what I can hear. And they used to evaluate players and be there like all night, but they would do it quick as possible. But they would give like a brief synopsis of of, of each day's training camp and where, where you know, the, the coach saw the guys, you know, and mm -hmm. um, 
Doug did it like once a week, but you gave like a little report per per the film session, you know, each day, but it was shorter. Okay. Yeah. And I don't necessarily know if that was just because of, because of COVID situation or not, but um, let's transition to a different topic because I feel like I've talked so much in that, doing that topic. No, that was but, good. That was good stuff. Um, okay. Let's let's transition to a, diff, a different topic. So um, this year we do have some, some open practices. Um, I believe we have open practice with the Patriots again and the Jets. Um, and we have these open these these um, these open practices that kind of leads to fights. Yep. Training camp fights. Is there any memorable training camp fight that you kind of remember? <laughs> and what do you think? Um, do you think it's just inevitable? Yeah, that training it, camp fights are going to happen. Yeah, it, they're going to happen no matter what. I mean, you got guy. I mean, and it, and it don't even have to be with another team. I mean, you fight your own. I mean, we saw that huge fight today. I heard about that huge fight today with the Giants. Um, so two things. So real quick, the biggest fight that I remember was um, Big John Runyon and Jaquay Thomas. <laughs> It was it was to the point, and I don't even know what started it. I don't even remember what year it was, but all I remember was at some point they were both just exhausted, and I just saw John. Now John's six 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 seven. Jaquay is a big boy, but he's not as big as John was, right? So they're both holding each other's helmets, and all I see is John just kneeing Jaquay in the rib cage over <laughs> and over and over and over, and I, I'll never forget the sound of it. It was like boom. Boom, boom. He ended up, he, he ended up breaking Jaquay's ribs. Did he? And that's when, yeah. <laughs> that was a brutal Dude. fight, man. We, yeah, we, dang, uh, nobody broke that up. That, y'all were fighting to the death, man. Man, you, are you jumping in front of Jaquay and, and, and John running? I'm not even. No. Gonna, yes, if I weigh 300 pounds, <laughs> yes, I'm jumping in there. I I'm didn't see anybody. 205, no, but to 300, <laughs> I'm jumping in there. <laughs> all I all I knew was I was I was like nah man I don't want none of that so um but yeah they're 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 bound to happen when you're around each other twenty four seven you know especially like it was in Lehigh you're around each other twenty four seven you're tired yeah. you know no sleep you know and you got your jokesters eat. like are you tired yeah you know like I remember no women a no times. women me one was still on Trotter a few times because Trotter was set up joking. <laughs> Well, especially oh, when you're a rookie, you know, you got all you got something to say. Little boot, little boot. Just his loud stuff. Little boot, little boot. I'd be like, man, if you don't shut up, man. Because <laughs> you, you, you're so tired. It's training camp. He always got something. Rook, go over here and do this, Rook. <laughs> Just loud all the time. But you can't beat him up because Trot was oh. built like, yeah, mm -hmm. Trot was, was a big dude. You know, so you just sat there and, and took it. But uh but that like that's the mentality because like you're hot, you're agitated, you've been around these same people, y'all don't have the same etiquette, y'all grew up in different homes, so things that you think are okay is not okay with this person and, and vice versa. So eventually somebody's gonna get hit. Somebody's going to be frustrated. I've seen fights happen in training camp because guys were being too encouraging, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, fat boy. Let's get going down this line. Let's go. Let's go. He's like, man, fat boy, who you talking to? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, like, I'm talking to you. And you ready to fight. Like, you're just trying to get him through the line. Like, come on. You take him forever. Everybody waiting on you. Right, so but now he want to fight you because he's hot, he hot, and he laughs, you know. So that, <laughs> that's <laughs> oh, that's too funny, man. <laughs> so training camp fights are inevitable. That it, it 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 will happen at some point, especially against your your rival position group. So the the DBs and receivers are going to fight. The safeties and tight ends or running backs and safeties are going to fight. D line offense and D line, and they fight every day. Every day, some something every happens where offense D line, they somebody's holding, 
somebody did something cheap and before you know it there is a hit that that goes out and not I mean, we don't talk about that too much it's like <laughs> somebody <laughs> there's a hit that goes out it's like dude man runyon did this do this let's get him <laughs> right yeah. next time you're in there let's get him and that's how the whole thing starts it's usually you start off with a hit somebody got mad somebody got embarrassed and before you know it hey jason just knocked one of the db down and before you know it, now, now for the rest of the practice, they're trying to get me. Yeah, and, oh yeah, and, and, and that's how it happened. <laughs> oh, that we 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 had a couple hits on put put a couple hits out on YouTube a couple times. It like, okay, all right, it okay. okay, all right, we gonna get him. We gonna get him. We gonna get him. <laughs> and I'm the worst though is when like the worst is when when it's the inner squad ones though. That's why I'm I'm surprised that a lot of people are doing them now. I mean, yeah. There's no law. There's no love loss. I mean, if it's your teammate, you might have like a little bit of like, ah, I might. I'm gonna ease I might, up a little. Yeah. <laughs> when there's an inner squad, oh, you getting all this elbow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it all depends on what type of players you have too. Like I remember us having an inner squad with the Patriots, and boy, when I say a key to lead didn't shut up. Oh my. Oh my goodness! I, I listen. I I I went against him just so we can shut up. I'm like, okay, you know, Wop Wop gave him the, the business. Oh man, you know what a ten yard route? I'm, I'm like, I, I caught it on you. I didn't call four or five of them on you in a row, and you're still talking. <laughs> Did like, he really say that ain't nothing but a ten yard yeah, route? Ten yard ain't nothing but ten yard route. In and out, we know you can break in and out. You know what I mean? That's how he was. And he just kept talk, kept talking, talking, and talking. Before you know it, you get into a fight with a couple, couple guys. It just happened because they just don't shut up. <laughs> you didn't have a gold chain on, did you? No, you saw when he snatched up uh, Mike Crabtree's <laughs> chain. He got yeah, him twice. Was, yeah, he'd have got decked for sure. <laughs> like that was one of those those you take my chain off. This is premeditated. Me getting your helmet off and you getting a real one. Yeah, so. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah, That's so funny. we'll see we'll see how those practices go. Now, um now with the here's the thing about the inner like the 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 inner squad type of, you know, practices that that we have. I remember the the um because the Eagles had to play the Ravens last year. And the tape that they used was a year before of the inscribed practice. That's what they kept Wait. going back to, right? Wait, so singing? the Eagles had to play the Ravens last year in a regular season. Lost to the Ravens at home. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. They played each other in a preseason the year before that, or maybe two. Could have been year, year two before that. And they trained against each other leading up to that preseason game. And the entire time, the only thing that we watched wasn't their games, was, was that practice. <laughs> so you know that you're stealing information from each other and you're getting like a close inside look on and you're hearing calls. You're at practice together, right? So yeah. these there are people that are – that are that are stealing information constantly. So I, why would you put yourself in that situation of being, you know, taken advantage of, especially when you have teams like the Patriots and we have a history of the NFL teams cheating and hiding guys and all type of stuff. So that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I think that you're giving away too much information. You're giving away more than you're gaining. Yeah, I think so too. And you know, to me, to me, when I think we kind of talked about it before too, is like you don't want to information, information from the film, but also information personnel wise with with yeah. the players. And we you, we talked about it where like if you're used to if I'm going against you in one on ones about two or three times, four or five times, you know, and I know what I'm doing, I know what you know what I'm not doing, and I'm able to watch and study and not be honest with myself. I could pick up some things on you. All right. So yeah. if I, or or if I'm playing safety and and you know I'm I'm in the deep middle and mm -hmm. let's say I'm I'm looking at Joe Flacco or Jalen Hurts, right? And I'm I'm reading the way he's you know he he eyes me down 
immediately and then turns the shoulder and throws it to the deep, the deep go route on the outside. So I'm picking up those little things as well. So not only am I able to pick up on scheme stuff, I'm able to read and learn little tidbits of information that I may not be able to process as, as quickly during a game. You know, mm. everything's a little bit slower in practice. So I'm able to, and, and not only that, it's like getting a free do over, right? It's like, yeah, if I get beat on something, I can watch it on tape and, you know, from practice yeah. and I can pick Keep up going. on some stuff. Right. Yeah. So I, I, that's another, you know, I agree with you hundred percent. I'm not big on them. Plus the potential for fights and, and you know, yeah, cheap shots and all kinds of stuff can happen out there. So I'm, I'm not a big Q, fan of it. Q, you jog my memory. Cause I remember, and this is kind of off topic, but you jogged my memory. And I think it's really, really good information for the fans to know. Um, Q jogged my memory because I remember my rookie year going down to um, Tampa. We were playing the Buccaneers. We lost on a 63 yard field goal, 64 yard field goal, something ridiculous. Like, Ryan, you right. remember that? Yeah. yeah. That was our rookie year, and I remember fumbling that game, and it was like one of those plays that kind of decided the game. A rookie will always get you. <laughs> um, but I remember that game because I, I I was playing, and I was kind of nervous because I was playing against Rondé Barber. Mm. And Rondé Barber couldn't cover me from, from if we were inside a phone booth together. But <laughs> you put him in a team setting – and you put him with a defense, you put him with boundaries and rules, this dude turned into a superhero. Mm -hmm. And I remember him touching Donovan's pass. I think he had a pick. And, and I remember, you know, asking him a question. He's like, no, I got this tip. And then a couple years later, I replayed him again. And I, he definitely got to pick that game. I think he the first game he got the tip, but the next the next time he had to pick it, and Don was the quarterback. And um, and I remember him getting picks on Donovan before I came. And he said to me, he's like, because I asked him, I said, dude, there's something that you're seeing. He's like, well, when Donovan gets off of a read, he's never going back there again. So therefore, I just run to the next read. Mm. So, so like we had this concept where there was a slant, outside slant, and there was an inside slant. You read it in cover two and cover four, which they ran all the time, cover two and cover four, inside out. So the first slant goes. He said if he didn't throw that first slant, he knew he was throwing the second slant, he would run to it. And that's how he used to. That's how he used to get picks on Donovan, just like wow. little tips like that. And it just jogged my memory, because like a little tip like that, if if once he goes, once he reads you, he's not coming back to you. Because there's quarterbacks that will see you cheating, like 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 Tom or Aaron, that will see you cheating, go come off and then then dot the guy that that that, that you came off of. Mm -hmm. And um, like these little details are differences in winning the NFC championship or little things like that. And the guy just had a beat, had one little piece of information on the guy. And it just made me think about that when we were talking about inner squad. And you never know like when he picked it up, how he saw that. And you're giving that team another opportunity by by being that close to you in these inner squad practices. That's what it that's what kind of made me jog my memory, um, my memory about that. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? But yeah. I, I asked him about it because I'm like, dude, you're always close to them. And I knew it on this concept. On this concept, it was lion. Um, we used to call it lion. We mm -hmm. have a drag inside, a drag, and a slant, which was built for cover one, cover three, right? Mm -hmm. That concept that's built for cover three. You 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 expand the flat defender so you can have a window to throw the ball, and then Lion was that two slant concept that's built for cover two. So you can number the first slant can take the defender out of the way or shield for mm -hmm. the hook defender. So you can throw the outside slant and, and in lion in, in particular, he would, he would always know when the slant was coming, when, when, when it was, when it was, he would always get his hands on it. and I asked him about it and he told me. Wow. So yeah. Film study. All right. Film, Film study. study. He was just yeah. different. Yeah. That's
he, he right. did he did pick pick us off all the time yeah <laughs> I got it, was sick that, of it was that it. it was that kind it, it was he he found something and and, yeah. and he, it held true to him and he kept it tight to his sleeve until he was old and realized that it was it was <laughs> you know because during that time he was at the end of his career but i always respected him because i was like how can this dude not cover anything but always touching the football and yeah. so i just asked him about it that's just that young curiosity <laughs> And I learned a bunch from it. Um, all right, next thing: teammates, best one, your 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 best teammates. Um, okay, yeah. Let me see. Time. So your best teammates. My 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 your favorite three. present company excluded. All right, you're one yeah, of my favorite company. teammates of all time. Um, obviously. You know, obviously, I've I've had a ton of respect for Doc, and it's been well documented. But I would say, three three guys that you may people may or may not know that were some of my favorite teammates. Number one was uh, Reno Mahe. Um, that was wow. a guy. <laughs> he was that's a that's a throwback. But that is he's such a great guy. I mean, he's always he was always smiling, um, always in a good mood, mm -hmm. um, always made you just feel comfortable. And um, <clears throat> he definitely anywhere we went, he knew somebody that could get a hookup for something, man. <laughs> he, he he got hooked up everywhere, man. I remember one time um, this funny story about Reno. You know, so you know he is well documented. He was trying to you know he was trying to save money, and um, you know he was he was working at Chickens and Peas in the off season one year, just you know kind of as a fun gig to do. Well, one one day he decided that he wanted to get a new car, so. Instead of going the normal route and buying a new car, he decides to go to a car auction to to buy a uh, <laughs> what was it? It was a Kia, and it was like an old school Kia. It was a green Kia. Wow! And he's like, "Yeah, man, I got this thing. It's awesome. It's like only like two thousand dollars for the for the car." And I'm like, two thousand dollars? That that I don't know. If you should have bought that, man." Yeah. He's like, "No, no, it's good. It's good. It's good." So, you know, he goes and he drives. I think he drives it like one day. And then it just he gives it to the practice to the practice facility and then just dies. <laughs> Most <laughs> it would not start. That Kia <laughs> sat in the parking lot of the uh, Novacare complex really for like almost a year, maybe two years. <laughs> and I was like, "Bro, are you gonna do anything with it? Like, isn't it in your name?" He's like, "Eh, yeah. <laughs> good." <laughs> that dude was hilarious, man. He just. He just just such a free free spirit. All right. So then so so Reno was one of my favorite teammates. He was hilarious. Um Sheldon Brown was another one of my favorite teammates. Mm -hmm. Just a great person all around. Um oh, yeah. All around. Know, good, great teammate. He helped me. We had the same agent for a little while and he helped me out with that, find a new agent. And um, you know, he just he taught me kind of the ropes a little bit and just kind of modeled my uh my career after him. Yeah. And then um Probably one of my other favorite teams, and I've actually gotten a lot, a lot closer to him since since retiring and since he's retired. But um, Trent Cole is probably one of my other favorite teammates that I had. Yeah, the dude is. I mean, he's he's one of the funniest guy, and I don't even know if he if he's he means hilarious. to be funny. Oh, um, he. I don't think he tries. <laughs> he does not try to be funny. <laughs> Trent is hilarious. He. This Trent dude, will tell you oh. a story, man. Go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah, his stories, man, especially his hunting stories, man. I don't want to get too graphic, but his hunting yeah. stories be cracking you up, man. But um, yeah, those are three of my three of my favorite teammates that I had, man. And mm -hmm. you know, been fortunate to meet a lot of great people along the way. But those three stand out the most right now. What about you, man? You know, besides yourself, besides like the obvious, because we talked about like Dawkins and stuff like that. Um, I'm gonna go with some people that that that. It's kind of hard to just to 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 minimize it to, to to three people yeah because there's some great teammates that you have over the years it is and it's, it doesn't do, do 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 them you know service to minimize it to three so we'll try that but one of my one of my favorite teammates i've ever had was lou keekley oh yeah lou keekley would when i when i first got to charlotte Jason, you um, we're we're going to we, off season. We're we're going to we're going to burrito place. You want to roll with us? 
Yeah. Sure, Luke, I'll roll with you. We go down the U.S. women's team playing soccer. You know, it's like that time of year where it's like World Cup soccer. We, we go out and have a good time. The next day, hey, man, I'm going to grab some lunch, man. You want something? So this is Luke. Like, he's taking orders like a rookie. Yeah. He's a starting team. Um, the most humble, worked the hardest, led by example, just great leader, like servant leader. And um, to me, that kind of spoke volume because it's the first time that there that someone that was the star of the team that everyone knew who he was was a pro all pro linebacker, mm-hmm. and um, how humble he was and how caring he was for his teammates. So I would say Luke Keekley's one. I would say Jeremy Macklin for me mm-hmm. was one of my favorite teammates because Jeremy will fight you, and I love that about him. Is that he 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 I remember us drafting him in the first round. We had receivers now. We it was me and it was Reggie Brown, it was Kevin Curtis. Um yeah. there was a guy named Brandon Gibson that they drafted the same oh, yeah, year. BG, yeah. Um, you know, we had Amendola on that team. Yeah. Like it was a bunch of receivers in that room. And Jeremy came in like, no, nah, I'm better than all y'all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, right. And I remember I like and I respected that. I respected the mentality of it. Now he didn't know how to work that yet. <laughs> and um, but I but I respected the mentality and I knew that I could depend on him. I couldn't always depend on everybody, but I knew that I could depend on him and he worked hard. And he loved the game of football and he did everything that he could in order to try to get better. And he was hilarious and he'll give you the shirt off his back. So I love so I love Jeremy Macklin for that. Um, so 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 he's one of my favorite my favorite teammates. And we used to we used to run the court. When I say run the court, when me and him was on the same court on the same team in basketball and off season, no matter what gym we run, we ran we ran about seven, eight games in a row. For real? I didn't <laughs> yeah. know he could hoop. Yeah, he had a heater. Jer- Jeremy King really? had a day. Yeah, he had a heater. Okay. And, uh, okay. So with, with my playmaking ability and his <laughs> jumper, man, was they and then we were in shape too with uh, with them dudes. So they oh, couldn't yeah. even throw a pass, right? So you it's hard. <laughs> like you throw a lazy pass, it was it was two. Like, so. <laughs> oh, you was playing defense like that? Oh, <laughs> like it's just it, it's you don't even have to really try just because you're in shape. Like you were yeah. we were football shape, you know, and so you can get to passes that normal people don't think you can get to. Yeah. So, like, you're just moving. It's like, oh, he threw that lazy foot in the ground, you know, <laughs> boom, lay up. <laughs> so, I remember I had, like, 12 bucket, 12 points in a row or something like that playing one of those games, just all off turnover. It's like, uh, dude, we can't even throw a pass in this gym. It's too small. <laughs> but um, that was fun. I, I would say my third teammate, my third favorite teammate, um, and like I said, I'm not going to say obvious. Um, probably, probably shady, because shady was funny, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. When I say funny, shady says stuff that everybody's thinking, and and he's going to talk about you. Like, don't he? He says some some off the wall stuff. To I can't even. I'm not going to even describe this story. I'm, I can't even describe. <laughs> But it was so funny. It was so funny, and we, mm-hmm. everybody was. You know, you know, you know. Yeah. The one rule that you don't supposed to do when you when you in the male, male's locker room is that when you're in the shower, you look toward the wall. <laughs> so, so this is like for people that don't know this, right? So when you taking shower showers with men, and you in, in National Football League, when you Looking in the shower toward toward people, something wrong. You think something wrong. So you look toward the wall. You don't make too much noise. You don't sing too many songs. You get your seven, eight wipes. <laughs> you out of there. Guys that want to turn around and face you and have conversations and with the whole, you know, um, Captain Morgan pose. You'd be like, hold on, something yeah. right about this. <laughs> 
Shady said something so off the wall to a dude during that time. I was busting up laughing because he was he wasn't following the shower etiquette. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> so Shady's one of my favorite teammates just for the laugh factor alone. I don't know if I've had as many laughs around anybody beside, you know, with no other teammate but Shady. Like just funny stuff that he's done over the years. That's awesome, man. I, I love funny teammates, man. That's <laughs> there's nothing better because they make the days just 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 fun, man. They Go make, by quick, man. Yeah. That's yeah, funny, so. man. That's good stuff, though. I like that. That's that's a good list, man. Much, much yeah, it's fun stuff, man. <laughs> fun yeah. stuff. Luke, um, Luke was an awesome teammate. Hold on, I gotta tell you this story. This is this is how I knew <laughs> I was I was ready to be. This is how I knew I had to retire. It was my last year playing. I was in uh, Carolina, and um, I think it was the game we were playing um, the Patriots, and we won like on the last last um, drive. Tom Brady threw up a, a hail mary, and it came in complete, and. Um, but during the course of that game, there was a long run that broke out. And, and I can't remember who it was, but I turned and I run and I'm just digging, digging, digging. And I could not catch this person. I can't remember, <laughs> I can't remember the running back. I could not catch this person, right? But I'm just roll like I'm like, oh, I'm feeling great. Man, Luke Keekley came from about 10 yards from in front of me, sprinted up to my level, sprinted past me and walked the dude down and caught him and tackled him. And he's 230, 240, 240 yeah. pounds around this time. And that's how I knew it's a, it's time that I, it's, it, a, it's a wrap. <laughs> All my speed is gone. <laughs> and no, nah, no, nah, he's a tremendous, he's a tremendous athlete. And I was still, and I was you still can roll, though. You can and roll I, back I can in run a little bit. And yeah. he made me like, like I was, uh, a turtle out there. Oh, man. <laughs> like, man, okay, yeah, this might be the last one for me. <laughs> you know, because it it happens so quickly that you don't know that you don't have it no more. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, because you in your mind, you still thinking this is Q 2006, 2007, <laughs> right? You know, and before you know it, you like, dang. What like, happened? I remember those young dudes putting hands on me. Like, I'm out there trying to shake the uh, young dudes. Chris, yes. I, I, I was like, oh, what is that? Did somebody just touch me in the middle of the road? No, you didn't. Just, did he just touch me? <laughs> like, nobody, nobody touches me. Like, who do you think you are, sir? Like, you must not know the rules. Oh, for real, <laughs> so man. Clearly, I'm, I'm like, I'm telling the referee, like, man, he holding me. Referee, like, man, he holding me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you're right, man. It, it does That's happen. Happens. Fast, it man. happens. It happens fast, man. My right. my my self esteem plummeted after that play. <laughs> That's how I have this good. You out there chasing them, <laughs> and he comes this dude two hundred forty five times. <laughs> And run him down, and everybody <laughs> seen him run past you. He's like, "Come on, man!" Yeah, man. And it was, and it was, a, it was like a, you know how the horse collar, right? You can't really pull the horse collar, but he was so fast enough that he like he grabbed the horse collar and still had enough speed to just just wrap around the dude. So he didn't. He was like, eh, eh. so yeah, it, it is. But yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> that's that. Was Last it. question. Last question of the day. All right, what we got? Now, yeah. right, so it's a question that's been going around. We kind of know. But, well, who do you think the best overall player on the Eagles is? We don't care if it's offense, defense, defensive line, offensive line, whatever it may be, special, special teams, whatever. Who's the overall Best player on the Eagles during training camp or just in general? Just in general, what do you think? Who do you think that our best overall player is? I'm gonna say I have an idea. It's only one of two players to me. To me, I, I say Fletcher Cox is the best overall player on the team, bar none. Um, next would be Lane Johnson, but Fletcher definitely takes it. Yeah, in my opinion. Mm, so yeah, so th th those definitely my three, three players. But I think that I think that it's Fletcher overall because the thing that people don't realize sometimes 
we get caught up in Fletcher's production and yeah. not realizing that every offense is designed to double team him. He rarely ever gets one on ones. And when he does, he gets pressure. Yeah. Um, so the defense, the offense is, is designed to stop that player because um, I just I just hope, you know, that we can get, you know, Javon Hargrave playing really well where there can be some where he can get a one on one often. Yeah. So we can see how dominant of a player he is. So I think that our overall best player, hands down, is Fletcher. I think number two, when healthy, is Brandon Brooks. I think Brandon Brooks is a better player, um, and is the is arguably top two or three at at his position at guard in the National Football League. And then I think you go to Lane, and you know down the lines um, after that. But I think that Fletcher is is, is by far the best player still on our team, even though I think that this may be his last year in the Eagles uniform. So we'll, we'll see how that, that that occurs, but that $100 million contract usually it do, doesn't last too long in the National Football League. So hopefully he can play really well and um, and, and warrant you know more money, but um, I think he's our overall best player. Um, I don't think it's close. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So that's going to conclude the Q&A show, ladies and gentlemen, this week. We had a blast like we always do. There's so many different um, topics to discuss. There's questions that we're going to get back to soon. Um, we want to say thank you to all the fans that's continue to make our show a success. We're looking forward to the season. We're looking for that fresh content of football so we can break down the X's and O's of the game um, this upcoming season. We're going to be glued to our television, glued to our phones, glued to social media, trying to see what's going on with our birds through our training camp. Hopefully we can see some, um, some flashes. We didn't do that this week. We'll talk about that next week about – um, the people that are trending in the right direction, people that are not trending in the right direction. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk about Jordan Malata and and um, and Dillard. Dillard. Um, they're, all the reports are saying that Jordan Malata has clearly taken over the left tackle position. Um, and Quez Watkins is balling like we like we talked about. He's been balling. That's the that's the that's one of the shining spots that we've we've seen. Yeah. Um, and so and we're looking him. forward to when um, they say Zach McPherson has been playing well, saying that he's the most physical corner. So there's a lot of things that are going on in training camp. We're going to make sure that we're relaying that information to you guys. We're excited about the season. We're excited about this show. Continue to tune in to the Q&A podcast on Inside the Birds platform, YouTube channel. Also, Amazon Music, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Submit your questions to InsideTheBirds at gmail.com. We really appreciate everyone um, from Jason Avant, Quint Michael. We want to say thank you guys for having us another week. Q? Yes, sir. As always, man, it's been a pleasure. Jay, thanks, man. <laughs>